if you are interested, this is a five, six part series, and I think that the church has posted the rest of the previous sermons on YouTube or the church website, whichever it is. And what I want to do this morning, as I told you before, as, as we've looked through uh, two sermons, the Sabbath and the Old Testament, uh, one on the New Testament, actually two on the New Testament as well. Uh, this week, I want to look at the Sabbath and what happened to it in post-New Testament history. Uh, what happened in history after Jesus, after the apostles died, what happened to the Sabbath? Uh, we have a couple texts of Scripture, but since this is history, and since the New Testament doesn't cover that portion of history, obviously there will be a lot of passages from historians and such the like. Um, but before we do that, let's, of course, start with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you that we've had the opportunity together to, to perhaps review, to, to look anew at uh, the Sabbath throughout the ages, what you've intended it to be for us, what you've intended for yourself to be for us, through the symbols that the, tab the Sabbath teaches. Father, this morning, we, as we've done before, want to invite you. I want to invite you into my heart. As I have weaknesses, if I have struggles, as I myself am a sinful man, there is no reason why anyone here would be blessed by me. It is you that we all need. It is you that we invite to be our teacher, to be our instructor, to give us an understanding of what has happened to the day that you have blessed the world with. As we do that, we invite your spirit to work in our midst, in our hearts, our minds, and it is this we ask, all of it in the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, so I want to start, I want to go back to the, the scripture reading. and I'm going to put it on the uh, screen here. I'm going to add verse 24. This is Daniel chapter 7. And before I read that, if you remember, Daniel 7 is a prophecy that started in Daniel the prophet's day. And God outlined future for Daniel. The rise and fall of nations and the effect that the rise and fall of nations would have on the church. So in this vision in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel sees four beasts. The first beast, you might remember, was a, a lion. And that, that lion represented the kingdom of Babylon. The second beast was symbolized as a bear. And Babylon was conquered by the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. But the Persians were conquered by that third kingdom. And that third kingdom was? Greece, Alexander the Great particularly, and it was symbolized in Daniel 7 as a leopard. And then we come to the fourth beast, which was symbolized by a nondescript. It was a dragon-like, perhaps, creature. And that kingdom was Rome. The... Uh, dragon, it says, picking up here in verse 24, had ten horns. And out of this kingdom, that is the fourth kingdom, the Roman kingdom, are ten kings that shall arise. And this outlines the fall, the disintegration of the Roman Empire into ten separate kingdoms. And it says, continuing, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be, sorry for the old English, different, diverse from the first ten. It's implying there the, the previous ten. And the, uh, this uh, kingdom would subdue three kings. Now, most, if not all, Adventists and other scholars, Christian denominations, theologians, pastors, etc., have interpreted this similarly to Adventists. That the first kingdom is Babylon, the second kingdom is Greece, the third kingdom, excuse me, I skipped one, Medo-Persia, then Greece, the fourth kingdom symbolized Rome, and then the, the ten divisions of the Roman Empire followed by the reign of the Roman Catholic Church, the Holy Roman Empire, they called it. That, that blending of church and state, all the other uh, 
kingdoms previous to this were, of course, religious too. They were pagan, but this one would be different. And historically, we have found that this is true, that there were those successions of kingdoms followed by the Roman church, the uh, different one, as it says in the text there. And it defines him. It says that he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out or persecute the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they, the saints, shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So I want to focus on the next to last phrase of the passage that he shall think to do two things. What shall he think to do? Change times and change laws. I'm not going to focus on the changing of times. I want to focus this morning on the changing of laws. And it has been told here in other places of the scripture similarly that, uh, like 2 Thessalonians is an example, the book of Revelation, another example, that in particular, the law of God would be subject to attack. And in particular today, we want to discuss how this prophecy has been fulfilled in regard to the Sabbath. Now, I want to start with a question. Who were the early Christians? Where did the early Christians come from? What type of people were they? They were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. He was a Nazarene. Uh, Peter, Paul, Luke, all of these men were, by birth, both ethnically and religiously, they were Jews. Now, I'm going to start with history in 49 A.D. Remember that the Christians started as Jewish converts to belief in the Messiah. And in 49 A.D., the emperor, Claudius Caesar, expelled the Jews from Rome because they constantly rioted at the instigation of Crestus. This is a quote from the historical book. And that's an erroneous transcription of the name of Christ. You remember that Peter and Paul and James and John, they would travel all over the world preaching the gospel of Christ. And anywhere there was a Jewish congregation, there would be converts to Christianity. But there would also be another thing. As one pastor said it, there would be a revival and there would be a riot. That's the nature of Christianity, by the way. Some people will love it. Some people will hate it. And everywhere the apostles went, there would be essentially that. There would be a revival, and people would be converted, and their hearts would melt afresh with the love of God. Their religion would become new and living, and at the same time, there would be a whole class of the existing religious folk who hated it, would throw Peter and John and the others in prison, torture them, and eventually put most of them to death, except for the apostle John. And when Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome, he did that because they were always being troublesome. Now, if you take the scripture and you turn with me to Acts chapter 18, I'm going to show you an interesting feature in scripture. Acts chapter 18, verse 2. And Claudius kicked the Jews out of Rome. He was tired of this. If you remember, uh, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, that when the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, Titus, the leader of the army, gave specific instructions not to do what? not to burn the temple. But the Jews defending the temple kept provoking and kept irritating, kept, kept annoying the Roman soldiers. So the Roman soldiers defied the orders of their leader and they cast a firebrand into the temple and it went up in smoke. It was that type of behavior that eventually caused the Romans to say, look, if you are going to be like that, you're out of here. And he kicked all the Jews out of Rome. Somebody read for me Acts chapter 18, verse 2. If you've got a nice, loud voice, if you'd read that for us. Don't jump all at once. Somebody got Acts 18? Please. And they found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, 
parentheses is because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. Okay, so I want to tie. So, I want to tie this portion of history right here to the Scripture. We're going to, we're going to leave the New Testament essentially with this passage. Number one, this is talking about Paul. And Paul made a couple of friends. Their names were? Priscilla and Aquila. And Priscilla and Aquila, what were they, by the way? They were tent makers. That was their occupation. Their religious background? They were, I heard both answers. They were Jews that were Christians. They believed in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And they were uh, co-workers with Paul and spreading the gospel throughout that region. But where had they come from? Rome. Because? Now, who did Claudius kick out? So why did two Christians leave Rome? There's a subtle answer here. And the subtle answer is, is that Christians looked like Jews. Rome could make no differentiation between a Jew and a Christian. There was no difference in where they worshipped. There was no difference in their diet. There was no difference in the day that they worshipped. The only difference between a Jew like Paul and uh, a, a Jew like Caiaphas was the simple belief that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. On every other point, they would be nearly identical to someone looking from the outside. You understand what I'm saying? So Aquila and Priscilla, Acts 18, verse 2, left Rome because Claudius had kicked out the Jews. And Claudius couldn't tell the difference, and the rest of the Romans in Rome couldn't tell the difference between a Jew and a Christian so all Christians were forced to leave Rome as well. Well, as the years go by, the hatred for the, uh, the Jews among the Romans grew. You're familiar with perhaps Seneca. He was a well-known Roman philosopher. He was constantly instigating anti-Semitic feelings. And I'm going to read at the, uh, about midway through that paragraph. This is according to Augustine, by the way. Uh, Seneca saying, they, the Jews, act uselessly in keeping those seventh days, whereby they lose through idleness about a seventh part of their life. You ever feel like that? I don't feel like that. If I didn't take a day off, I'd probably lose the seventh part of my life. So would most of you. So they lose through idleness about a seventh part of their life, and also many things which demand immediate attention are damaged. In other words, these guys, by taking a day off every week, neglect a whole bunch of stuff, and the world's going to fall apart. He didn't like them. But could he tell the difference between a Jew and a Christian? That's the question. If you keep going here, A.D. 64, the uh, city of Rome is burned to the ground. There's a lot of uh, talk here about what exactly happened. Some people believe that Nero did it so that he could blame it on the Christians. Nero did indeed blame Christians for burning of the city, uh, although it's believed he had an agenda to build a bigger temple or a bigger uh, uh, palace, excuse me. But anyway, according to the historian Tacitus, Nero blamed the Christians. Evidently, in the 14 years between the previous passage I read you, that the, uh, the, dif the distinction between Jews and Christians was somehow widening, at least in the city of Rome. There was somehow a difference between a Jew and a Christian. How can you kick out a Christian if you don't know what a Christian is, right? But this is in Rome. The Jews had already been kicked out, if you remember, a couple of years before. It's an interesting thing there just to think about. But going on here to A.D. 80, this is from a Jewish perspective now. This is known as the synagogue curse. Uh, uh, Gamaliel II, you remember Paul, studied under Gamaliel I. Gamaliel II had come up with this idea here. And the idea was is that at some point during the service that everybody had to pronounce this curse on the Christian religion. And uh, as, the, as the, the congregants pronounced this curse, anybody that was really a Christian would want to curse themselves, right? So they would stutter or somehow... Uh, hesitate, and here's what the curse read as. May the apostate have not any hope, and may the empire of pride be uprooted promptly in our days. 
May the Nazarenes, who was a Nazarene, by the way, remember? Jesus. And, and Jesus' followers were known among some groups as Nazarenes. We still today have that congregation, that Christian organization we call the Church of the Nazarenes. Okay, so may the Nazarenes and the men perish in an instant. May they all be erased from the book of life, that they may not be counted among the righteous. Blessed be thou, O God, who bringest down the proud. Let's ask a question here. Why would there be a need to have a curse pronounced in the synagogue on Sabbath morning? A curse specifically against the Christian, the Nazarite faith, if you want to call it that. Why? Subtle answer, again. Where were the Christians? Yeah. They were there in the synagogue with the Jews, 80 AD. When did Jesus die? Okay. When? Conflicting answers here. 31. 31. 50 years after Jesus died, the Christians are still worshiping in the synagogue on Sabbath morning so that the Jews can't even tell who in the congregation is a Christian and who in the congregation is a Jew. Now, all conspiracy theorists are enraptured with the idea of Jesuits, right? So we're going to pretend this morning there's a Jesuit among us. And I can't tell which one of you it is. So what would I do? Oh, they concocted this little scheme to get, get somebody to pronounce a curse on themselves. And, and of course, if, uh, you know, if Taylor, all of a sudden, while, while Joan is reciting the curse, gets really quiet, Joan's going to say, hey, he didn't say it. Hey, he didn't say it. Hey, you're, he's a Jesuit, right? No, he's a Christian. So this is their little plan. This is their little scheme. But my point here is that 50 years after Jesus died, the Christians were still fellowshipping in the synagogues on Sabbath morning with the Jews so that if you were sitting in church, you wouldn't know the difference one from another. Why were Christians still in the synagogue on Sabbath morning? Because they were. We're Sabbath keepers. Now, most of your non-Adventist friends are going to say, well, they're just being like Peter and Paul, and you know, they only went to the synagogue so they could convert the Jews. If there was, uh, going back to the Jesuit, if Taylor was a Jesuit, and he was at church this morning doing some uh, proselytizing, some evangelism, wouldn't you know it when he opened his mouth to convert you to the faith that he's trying to convert you to? And that's exactly the point here, is that the Christians weren't just going to Jewish church to convert Jews to Christianity. They were going to church because that's what God had commanded them to do on the day that God commanded them to do that. And the only place to do that was in the synagogue. They didn't establish new churches. You read the whole New Testament. You will not find a single Christian that independently established a separate denomination with its own little church on the corner of the town. It wasn't there. They went to church where everybody else went to church on the same day that everybody else went to church. Uh, about 20 years later, moving on in the story here, the uh, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic feeling had spread to Christians. And about this time, there's an entire body of anti-Jewish literature being produced by Christians of the second century because the Christians were trying to distance themselves from Jews because the Romans were persecuting both of them at the same time. Now, if, um, if Lori does something here, and, and we'll just let you use your imagination. She's been a bad girl. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, Lori's going to get arrested, but they're going to haul Virginia off to jail with Lori. Is that fair? It's not fair. Would you want Virginia to go to jail with Lori? Such a sweet lady, isn't she? Okay. Now... Virginia, do you want to go to jail? <laughs> <laughs> so
So, of course not. Nobody wants to go to jail if they've not done something that's wrong. And the Christians of that day, you can't blame them. They didn't want to be persecuted for, for the things that the Jews had instigated in the Roman Empire. So the Christians themselves were trying to say, hey, wait, 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 look, Romans, we're not the same. Don't, don't persecute us. We're not the same. So they started to attack the Jews just like the Romans were. A few short years later, 35 years later, the emperor Hadrian uh, issued an edict. I'm going to paraphrase some of this. Saying that no Jew could even live in Jerusalem. That the tension between the Romans and the Jews had gotten that bad that if you see in the middle of the screen there, that uh, he forbid the Jews to enter their own city for years. In their own city, they couldn't practice their religion. They couldn't worship. They couldn't even live there. And the effect that this had was to widen the gap of distinction between the Christians and the Jews because Christians did not want to be persecuted for things that the Jews had done. And none of us would want to do that either. But the problem starts to come in with how they decided to distinguish themselves from the Jews. And about that same time, there was a controversy over when Easter would be celebrated. It's known as the Easter controversy. Do we keep Easter on Sunday, because that's the day of the week that Jesus rose from the grave, or do we celebrate Easter on the typical day of the Passover, as has been done for thousands of years? Which, by the way, Easter is a pagan word. We all know that. The Easter is uh, English for Ishtar, the fertility goddess of the Romans. But there was a debate, and I'll read you here what they decided to do. Uh, let's see, a second sentence there. Rome, on the one hand, promoted the celebration of Easter on Sunday, while the churches, now catch this distinction here, the churches where? In the East, held to the Jewish date, of Nisan 14, that's the traditional date for the Passover. Sunday worship and the Easter service come to be treated as basically the same service in the West, commemorating the same event. Uh, church historian Eusebius writes, while the Jews faithful to Moses sacrificed the Passover lamb once a year, we men of the new covenant celebrate every Sunday our Passover. Now Eusebius lived in the fourth century, that's the 300s. So he's writing uh, a little bit different than the, the 135 time period. But that became their, their philosophy. We celebrate Easter in honor of the resurrection uh, on Sunday, just like Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday. But the church in the East did not do that. They kept celebrating on, uh, on the, the Jewish 14th of Nisan. Uh, going on in this, uh, we have the first reference ever. This is a key point right here. The first ever reference in history to Sunday observance. You can scan the books of history. There is no other earlier reference to Sunday worship than this one right here. And it says this. Further, this is the epistle to Barnabas, by the way, the epistle of Barnabas. And this is not Barnabas-like in the New Testament. This is a uh, pseudo-Barnabas, somebody either... Uh, stole the name of Barnabas, which was very common in that time period to steal an apostle's name or some patriarch and, and make that the title of your letter uh, to give credibility. So in this letter, here about the year 130, 138, he writes, Further, he says to them, Your new moons and Sabbaths I cannot endure. We read this from Isaiah here a few weeks ago. You see what it means? It is not that I have made on which, having brought everything to rest, I know it's a little hard to read here, I will make the beginning of an, what? Of an eighth day. How many days are in the week? Anyway, that is the beginning of another world. This is why we also, he's talking about Christians, we also observe the eighth day with rejoicing on which Jesus also arose from the dead and having shown himself ascended to heaven. It's the first ever reference. When did Jesus die? No, no, a year. I'm sorry. What year? 31. What year is this? If Jesus changed the day of worship and the apostles worshiped on the new day of worship, Sunday, 
Why does it take 100 years to find a historical reference to it? Just coincidence, all the documents got burned? I mean, why is it not there? Why is it 100 years before somebody says, by the way, this is the day we worship on at Sunday, and uh, here's why we do it? Why is it 100 years? This here, a few short years later, is the actual first reference in literature, that's existing literature, to an actual Sunday service. And uh, it says here that the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read. So they're reading the Bible, it's a good thing. As long as time permits, then when the reader is ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Anything wrong with this so far? Right? Read the scripture, exhort to do good things. This is all fine. But Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world. He goes on. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day rose from the dead. For he was crucified on the day before that of Saturn, and on the day after that of Saturn, which is the day of the sun, having appeared to his apostles and disciples, he taught them these things which we have submitted to you also for your consideration. So there he gives you his rationale. He's told you about their church service and what they do, and everything sounds pretty good. Read the Bible and encourage the church members to be active in doing good. Um, it's written by Justin Martyr. Anybody recognize that last name? Okay, Justin Martyr was, i uh, give you a little history on him. He was born a pagan in a Gentile home. He, for many years, tried to become a teacher, uh, that was his objective, of the modern philosophical, uh, philosophical thought. So he, he tried to go to these different schools of philosophers and studied Plato and all this other stuff. And finally, he talked to a guy who converted him to Christianity, and he did actually wind up losing his life. He was beheaded in about 165, I believe, uh, because he refused to, to uh, give up his faith in Christ, and the pagans killed him. Uh, what's interesting here, and I want to point out, is that he lived in Rome. Where did he live? His school that he started as a Christian teacher was in Rome. That'll become key later on. First reference to a Sunday church service, somewhere between 138 and 160. We don't know when he wrote that. Uh, to go on here, this is what they did next now. Uh, about 144, there was a heretic, the church decreed that this guy, Marcion, was a heretic. But he promoted Sabbath fasting in order not to accomplish on that day, which was ordained by the God of the Jews. And uh, going on here, Marcion was re uh, you know, rejected by the Church of Rome. But his notion of Sabbath fasting was kept. The effect being to turn what was a day of joy into a day of gloom, weariness, and sorrow. And in the year 314, Pope Sylvester, following the same line of thinking, writes this, if every Sunday is to be observed joyfully by the Christians on account of the resurrection, then every Sabbath on account of the burial of Christ is to be regarded in execration of the Jews. In fact, all the disciples of the Lord had a lamentation on the Sabbath, bewailing the buried Lord, and gladness prevailed for the exulting Jews. But sadness reigned for the fasting apostles. What were they doing? What were the apostles doing? They were fasting. In like manner, we are sad with the saddened by the burial of the Lord. If we want to rejoice with them in the day of the Lord's resurrection, in fact, it is not proper to observe, because of Jewish customs, the consumption of food and the ceremonies of the Jews. So here's what they did. We'll make Sabbath this lousy, burdensome, annoying, heavy day. Nobody can be happy on the Sabbath. You know, is there any other pleasure in life that trumps food? Okay. I mean, unless your wife's a bad cook or, I mean, I don't know. Or you got to eat at the school cafeteria all the time. We all love to eat, right? Um, pleasures between a man and a wife don't occur every day. Pleasures between father, mother, and children don't last all the time either. Kids get old and move on. But every day, people get to eat. 
And, and look at our church service day. We're going to have church, and then we're going to go out there, and we're going to eat together. Now imagine we establish a new rule today that you better not eat before you come to church because you might get sleepy and miss the sermon. And you better not enjoy that food after church. In fact, we're not going to eat at all because, you know, how many of you would like that? This is church instituted policy right here. It came straight from the top. Um, no eating. But ah, when the sun goes down, we have a party. How long would it take for every young person in this room, uh, like this little guy right here, to learn that Sabbaths are pretty lame, and when the sun goes down, it's pretty cool? Now, I've mentioned this before, so I won't go into it. But I don't think that it has to be food. We can still do that with the Sabbath. We can make this day as boring as can be, and everybody's itching for the sun to go down so we can go to the ball games and go to the mall and go eat and go party and go do whatever it is that we've been wanting to do for the last 24 hours and, and teach, by example, all of our young people, this, this is really a joke. And that's what they did in history. We'll have a party on Sunday, and we'll make everybody starve on Saturday. You should think about this here. A lot of instruction for us. So uh, this is uh, 150. I believe that this is uh, Justin Martyr again. Listen to what he says about this. Uh, talking about circumcision right here. According to the flesh, which is from Abraham, was given for a sign that you, the Jews, may be separated from other nations and from us, the Christians, and that you alone may suffer that which you now justly suffer. Remember, they were being persecuted by the Romans. And that your land may be desolate, your cities burned with fire, that strangers may eat your fruit in your presence, and not one of you may go up to Jerusalem. Moreover, this is a different uh, paragraph here, moreover that God enjoined you to keep the Sabbath and impose, what word did he use? Impose. What do you impose on people? Huh? Something they don't like. Something they don't like. Penalties. Fines. Fees. Consequences. God imposed on you, Jews, other precepts as a sign, as I have already said, on account of your unrighteousness and that of your fathers. So the Christians had developed the idea that the Sabbath and circumcision, but particularly the Sabbath, was a sign so that everybody in the world would know who a Jew is so that God could punish them. That's the philosophy. And that is largely the philosophy today. It's really ironic. If you talk to almost any non-Adventist, oh, that's for the Jews. It's for the Jews. That's their philosophy. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a uh, out of left field type thing, but it will relate. About 175, 190 in that ballpark, uh, the, the Church of Rome developed the idea that she was the queen. She was the, she was the, uh, the pinnacle of Christianity. And Irenaeus, the church father, wrote the following, the very great the very ancient and the universally known church founded and organized at Rome by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul. For it is a matter of necessity that every church should agree with, which church? This church, on account of its preeminent authority. That is the, and he goes on there, and I'll skip that. What you see right here is the development of Roman authority. And, and with the idea that the Church of Rome can tell everybody else what to do came the idea that everybody else had to do what Rome was doing. And I've already kind of hinted at this. What were they doing in Rome? They're worshiping on Sunday by now. They're worshiping on Sunday. I'm going to develop this thought a little bit more. And, and I want to say this. Is the big church in Phoenix more important than the church in Benson? Okay. This is a dangerous concept that size determines value and authority. That concept right there on the screen is what contributed to the removal of the law of God, particularly the Sabbath. Because you are smaller in number, it does not mean that you are less valuable 
or should have less say or contribution to the cause of God. Now, this all turns on people here, uh, turns on the Christians of that day. It's about the year 200. And this letter right here, let me look real quick, is from uh, Tertullian. Tertullian was a church father again, uh, like Justin Martyr. And this letter, however, is a letter to pagans. It's a letter to pagans. Because the pagans had started to attack the Christians because the Christians were doing what all the pagans do. Just think about that. The Christians were doing what the pagans do, and so the pagans start persecuting the Christians. Let me read it to you here. And, and Tertullian is defending himself in this letter against the attacks of pagans. Others, with greater regard to good manners, it must be confessed, suppose that the sun is the god of the Christians. Now, why would a pagan think that the sun is the god of the Christians? Because they're worshiping on Sunday. And Sunday is the day of the sun. A pagan should be confused. Well, because it's a well-known fact that we pray towards the what? By the way, Jews were supposed to pray towards the west facing the temple, the sun and the east at their backs. Or because we make Sunday a day of festivity. What then? Do you do less than this? Do not many among you with an affection of sometimes worshiping the heavenly bodies likewise move your lips in the direction of the sunrise? It is you at all events who have even admitted the sun into the calendar of the week and you have selected its day in preference to the preceding day as the most suitable in the week for either an entire abstinence from the bath or from you know, postponement until evening. That's a weird thought by itself, but don't take a bath on Sabbath either. So, or for taking rest and banqueting. By resorting to these customs, you deliberately deviate from your own religious rights to those of strangers. For the Jewish feasts on the Sabbath and the purification and Jewish also are the ceremonies of the lamps and of the fasts of unleavened bread, feasts rather of unleavened bread, things what's supposed to be, and the littoral prayers and all which institutions and practices are of course foreign from your gods. Wherefore, that I may return from this digression, you who reproach us with the sun and Sunday should consider your proximity to us. We're not far off from your Saturn and your days of rest. Hold up, did you catch that? What he's saying is, is tantamount to this. Let's pretend for a second, and I'm going to be extreme, but there's a stripper in the church right here. She's just dancing away, all right? And some pagan, serious, some pagan says, what are you doing? And the Christian responds, well, you guys do it all the time. That's his logic. The pagan says, why do you worship on Sunday? The Christian says, hey, what's the big deal? You do the same thing. Is that good logic? Is that biblical logic? Now, listen, here's my point. The Christians distinguished themselves from the Jews because they wanted to avoid persecution. And so they started doing what the pagans do. And then the pagans turned on them and started persecuting them really for being fools, for being hypocrites, for being wishy-washy, halfway Christians. Friends, you will never gain anything by trying to avoid persecution. And if it's anything like this, you'll wind up being persecuted anyway. It never pays to compromise. It will never pay to attempt to make our church more popular by doing what everybody else does. It will never pay. You will always lose. And they lost real hard right here. Justin Martyr, as I said a second ago, lost his life at the hands of the pagans. He goes on, Tertullian goes on with this. And uh, talking about the Jews here, middle of the paragraphs, he picks up from Scripture, your Sabbaths, your new moons and ceremonies. My soul hates quoting the Scripture. By us to whom Sabbaths are strange and the new moons and festivals formerly beloved by God, the Saturnalia and the New Year's and the Midwinter's festivals and the Matronalia are frequently uh, frequented. Presents come and go, New Year's gifts, games join the noise, banquets join the den. He goes on with this. 
This is their logic. No scripture, just paganism. You go on. I'm going to skip now. This is uh, about 70 years. And this is going to be a quote from uh, Eusebius. Eusebius is a well-known church historian. A very extensive amount of his writing is left uh, for people to read today. The logos, that's Greek word for word. Uh, the word, in other words, is transferred by the new alliance, the celebration of the Sabbath to the rising of the light. He has given us a type of the true rest in the saving day of the Lord, the first day of light. In this day of light, first day and true day of the sun, when we gather after the interval of six days, we celebrate the holy and spiritual Sabbaths. All things whatsoever that were prescribed for the Sabbath, we have transferred them to the Lord's day, that's Sunday, as being more authoritative and more highly regarded and first in rank and more honorable than the Jewish Sabbath. In fact, it is on this day of the creation of the world that God said, let there be light, and there was light. It also on this day was that the son of justice has risen for our souls. Uh, this is, um, like I said, about 90 or 70 years later, and uh, you can see again their logic. There's nothing really new to comment on. I'm just being a little bit um, exhaustive. Uh, about the turn of the fourth century, Constantine, the emperor, wrote a letter, which was recorded by Eusebius, uh, being the historian of that day. And this is what uh, Constantine says in his letter. It appeared an unworthy thing that in the celebration of this most holy feast, that is Easter, we should follow the practice of the Jews who have impiously defiled their hands with enormous sin and are therefore deservedly afflicted with blindness of soul. Let us then, Christians, remember he's converted now, let us then have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd, for we have received from our Savior a different and pray continually that the purity of your souls may not seem in anything to be sullied by fellowship with the customs of these most wicked men, the Jews. All should unite in desiring that which sound reason appears to demand and in avoiding all participation in the perjured conduct of the Jews. If it's not screaming to you by now, it should be, that there was no other motivation than to just not like, look like a Jew. There's no other motivation. There's no biblical motivation for Sunday worship. It's not like they sat down, prayed, and fasted, and studied the scripture until they came up with this theology that was different. It's all the, I don't like Jews, and I just don't want to be like one. That's it. That's all there was to it. It occurs over and over and over again. Uh, going on here, uh, 360, about 50 years later. Now, this is a significant point. I've got a couple slides left. That's about it. 360, the church in Rome had what's known as the Council of Laodicea. Listen to what they determined in this council. Christians shall not again Judaize and be idle on Saturday, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's day they shall especially honor, and as being Christians shall, if possible, do no work on that day. If, however, they are found Judaizing, by the way, what does it mean right here to Judaize? To keep the Sabbath. If they are found Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. I do not want to be political. So I'm going to use an example because it's fresh in all of our minds. But don't be political with me here. Obamacare, as they've called it, has now been confirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court. And everybody here has two years to get medical insurance or they will face a fine, or the Supreme Court called it a tax. Okay? If everybody had medical insurance, would there be a need for a tax, a penalty? Okay? If no one was worshiping on Saturday, would there be a need for that decree? Think about that. The year 360. 330 years after Jesus died, Sabbath keeping is prevalent enough that the church in Rome needs to have a meeting and decide that those people who are worshiping on Saturday need to be excommunicated. They would not have done that if no one was doing it. Make sense? 
But of course, Jesus changed the Sabbath to Sunday. It just took the church 300 years to figure it out. You following me? They go on here. This is about uh, oh, 80 years later or so. No Sabbath Eucharist. What's Eucharist? Lord's Mass, the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Jesus. Listen to this is uh, uh, ecclesiastical history of Socrates. Not the same Socrates you're thinking of, perhaps, but different guy. For although almost all churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries on what? Of every week, yet the Christians of Alexandria, that's in modern day Egypt, and at Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, have ceased doing this. Did you catch what he just said? Here, read that again. 439, 400 years after Jesus has died, 400 years after he supposedly changed the Sabbath to Sunday. Most churches throughout the world are still having mass, if you want to call it that, on Saturday. But on account of some ancient tradition, the folk in Rome and Alexandria do it on Sunday. That's, boy, the church learns slow. This is just a year later. This is Sozomen. The people of Constantinople and almost everywhere assemble together on the Sabbath as well as on the first day of the week, which custom is never observed at Rome or at Alexandria. What custom is never observed in Alexandria or Rome? Keeping the Sabbath. What you see there in the last two slides is that and I think I actually put a map in here. Yep, I did. I'm going to come down here and use my pointer. This is the uh, Roman Empire. This map is uh, 250, 270. Um, it's talking about the invasions of the barbarians, but I'm not concerned with that right here. What it shows is the Roman Empire. Okay? And you remember earlier that I had you say uh, a direction. Remember? I had you comment on the word east. Okay? The church in the east would have been right over here. The church of the west would have been the church over here. Justin Martyr had his school right there. That's Rome. Tertullian lived in Carthage, which was in northern Africa, right there. That's just a jump across the puddle to Rome. Okay? And what he says there at the last slide is that the churches in Rome and Alexandria, which would have been right over there, which were the westernized cities, were the first ones to stop worshiping on Saturday. But everywhere else, or as he said, almost the whole world, still worships on Saturday. That would have included all the folk over here. Sunday worship didn't start with Jesus. It didn't start with the apostles, whose headquarters, the headquarters of the Christian church, which was not in Jerusalem, eventually was in Antioch, which was just north of Palestine on the coast. The Christian church was established in the east. In fact, the word Christian, if you read Acts chapter 11, was a word given to the disciples in Antioch. The, the church, the name Christian, got its name in the east. Sunday worship came from the West, the seat of paganism, in addition to Alexandria and Egypt. Um, just like the prophecy says, but not like the scripture teaches. In other words, what I'm saying is, is that Daniel 7 says that he, that little horn, would think to change times and laws. He resided, its seat was in Rome. And from there, Sunday worship spread to other parts of the empire, but it took 400 years plus to do it. Most people in society, most Christians, just have this idea that Jesus, whoops, that Jesus spoke the word and all of a sudden the whole Christian world worshiped on a different day. But that's not true. 
I want to put one more slide on the screen here. Oh, uh, before I do that, a little side note, by the way. How many of you value your scripture? You value the Bible. There are, at least as it pertains to the New Testament, more than 5,000 copies of the New Testament in Greek. I'm talking about ancient manuscripts that have been found here and there, synagogues buried in the sand, strange places they found them in the east. They are known as the Byzantine text, and they came from the eastern portion of the Roman Empire. There was a dramatic difference between the eastern church and the western church. The eastern church valued the scriptures, meticulously safeguarded them. And if you do any type of research on the internet, um, you'll find easily what's referred to as the Byzantine text, named after the Byzantine Empire, which was in the east. The, uh, the western church didn't value the scriptures. There are three manuscripts of the New Testament that predominantly come from the East. 5,000, excuse me, I got that mixed up. There are three that come from the West. There are more than 5,000 that come from the East. That should say something to you about the, the spirit of the Eastern Church, the spirit of the, of the churches that Peter and Paul established when they fled from Jerusalem at the hands of Jewish persecution. They valued the scriptures and they read the scriptures for years and years and years, followed the teachings of the scriptures, including Sabbath worship in the East. In Rome, where paganism had such an enormous influence on the church, they stopped reading the Bible. And, and paganism infiltrated the church in the form of its practices and customs. Sunday didn't come from Jesus. Sunday came from somewhere else. This last slide here, um, Thomas Aquinas, he lived in the 13th century. Thomas Aquinas is known as the prince of Catholic theology. Um, he is highly revered in the Catholic Church. Anybody here, by the way, raised Catholic? Okay. Did you ever have to read any of Aquinas' material? Did you go to Catholic school or any of that? You did? Okay. Uh, still today, heavily revered in the Catholic Church. Of course, he's been made a saint, I'm sure. And in his book, uh, this is his, his monumental work, Summa Theologica. This is what he writes. In the new law, the observance of the Lord's day took the place of the observance of the Sabbath, not by virtue of the precept, that is, not by scripture, folk, but by the institution of the church and the customs of the Christian people. Thomas Aquinas, the prince of Catholic theology, saying himself, Sunday, it's not about the Bible. It's about church authority. It's about custom. It's about tradition. That church, the church of Rome. Not the Christian church at large. Not the church in the east. Not the saints scattered abroad everywhere. And forget all the stuff that Tertullian said. Forget all the stuff that Justin Martyr said about the day of the resurrection and, and the day of the new light and bringing life to the earth. Forget all that. Thomas Aquinas it's about authority. It's about custom, tradition, and the simple fact that we said to do it, and you're going to do it. Because if you don't, we'll excommunicate you. Isn't that great? It's amazing. I want to summarize here. Number one, Roman hatred for the Jews led to persecution of the Jews and the Christians. The Christians wanted to distance themselves from the Jews to avoid being persecuted. One example of this was the date of celebrating Easter. Remember the church in the east celebrated on the Passover, Nisan 14. The uh, church in the west decided they would go with the Sunday, uh, the literal day. Uh, about 80 AD, the Jewish leaders themselves are still trying to figure out and identify which Christians are sitting in their synagogues, and so they come up with the synagogue curse. You don't have until 138, remember this, a hundred years after Jesus, before the first ever reference to Sunday worship. And uh, eventually they made Sabbath a fast day, while Sunday becomes a feast day. In the year 360, 330 years after Christ, the Laodicean Council decrees excommunication for Christians who are still keeping the Sabbath. And finally, still, 440, 410 years after our Lord, most churches outside of Rome 
most churches outside of Alexandria and Egypt are still worshiping on Saturday. And you know what happens next? The Crusades. Wipe them out. They won't do it? Wipe them out. And Sabbath observance nearly obliterated because anybody who didn't care would capitulate at persecution and everybody that did care was killed. Why are there no Sabbath keepers through so many hundreds of years? It's the rest of that prophecy, Daniel 7. And they, the saints, shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and the dividing of time. Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with who? The remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of Jesus and have the testimony of Jesus. You know, my conclusion, and I encourage you to do some study for yourself. Everybody in this room is worshiping on the right day. There's no biblical support for doing anything else. There's no historical support for doing anything else. There are some things that we can learn from history. As they say, if you don't know it, you're destined to repeat it. You'll never gain by compromising. If you believe in the Sabbath, keep it as God intends it. You will never prosper by compromise. The people who you would compromise to favor, as we saw there, will turn on you eventually. You'll never prosper by compromise at all. And finally, there are a few people in places of the world that cherish the scripture. There were people who were willing to die for what they believed in. They have a reward. They have a promise that God, as Jack read this morning, to cause them to ride on the high places of the earth to feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. You in heaven will have that robe of red if you were to suffer as a martyr. For eternity, the spilling of your blood would be immortalized on your robe. If you think about it, what have we to lose? We have the right. We have the truth. I want to be proud about it, but I want to be confident in it. And I want to be confident that Jesus will offer me will offer you the promise to those that are faithful. Would you like to be faithful? Would you like for God to reward you? It's not about works, but there's a reward. Would you like God to reward you for your faithfulness? I would. I would. Pray for me. I'll pray for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we've had six weeks, five weeks, whatever it's been. We have looked through Scripture.